Hello again, I'm Dr. Jim Coyle. And this tutorial in the Challenges in Human Behavior series uh, discusses trauma and trauma-informed practice. First, it's important to consider what exactly is a traumatic event. And um, exp it's experiencing or witnessing an actual or a threatened death or serious injury, particularly an injury that's a, to the physical integrity to yourself or others. Traumatic events often include feeling unsafe, feeling frightened, helpless, um, powerless to stop what's going on. The threat is usually physically intrusive and may be repeated but it's also important to recognize that trauma can occur from witnessing an event, even if you are not personally threatened. Trauma affects brain functioning. And there's an interesting um, video that I'm gonna suggest you watch that describes just how that happens. The link is in the comments. And I suggest that you watch that video and consider how trauma affects structural changes as well as brain chemistry. Traumatic experiences are stored in multiple parts of the brain. There's the narrative memory of the event itself, but there's also emotional memory, there's body sensations, and there's also links with other traumatic memories. I will put some links in the uh, comments and in your notes for some more information about this. What influences a person's reaction to trauma? Um, not everybody responds the same, but there's certain things that can influence it. First of all is the intensity and the intrusiveness, whether it's a single event or multiple events. Um, whether a person experiences disempowerment or, or oppression also can influence how they experience a traumatic event. The person's appraisal and coping skills, their personal and community beliefs, as well as their supportive resources. Well, recognize that a person's coping skills are dependent upon the cognitive and physical development. Therefore, children, their reaction to trauma is generally um, much more intense because they haven't learned the coping mechanisms and skills that adults have learned. There's a number of symptoms associated with trauma. People may feel anxious or afraid. Uh, there may, they may be uh, anhedonic or dysphoric, that is having no feelings um, or sad feelings. Um, externalizing anger or aggression, um, kind of just, dissociation, depersonalization, derealization, which are splits from reality, as well as intrusive memories or altered cognitions. There's also a range of reactions to trauma, from coping with extreme stress to an acute stress reaction, um, learned patterns of avoidance, post-traumatic stress disorder, dissociation, and sometimes even resilience. There are a number of theoretical perspectives that have been used when exploring trauma. Um, Bessel van der Kolk has done some groundbreaking research on the neurobiology of trauma and how it affects the brain. Um, psychodynamic theory has been used as well as cognitive behavioral theory in order to suggest different ways of um, focusing treatment and uh, that's going to be helpful for the person. Stress and coping theory in general is a, a theory that talks about how do we cope with stressors. Um, Hoffman and Krusik suggested a bioecological model for studying the uh, impact of natural disasters, uh, such as floods or other things, other catastrophes. Uh, Post-traumatic growth is another theory that's very interesting. It's related to resilience. And it suggests that when people experience very stressful events, including trauma, it can actually lead towards them developing more personal strengths. I couldn't fit all of these um, 
uh, references on the slide with the, uh, the theories. And I know it's hard to get it here, but um, it is in these um, references are placed in your notes so that you can um, look for these particular um, the theoretical articles. There's a number of interventions which have been used to uh, address trauma. As we mentioned earlier, uh, psychobehavioral therapy has been um, found to be particularly effective in dealing with some of the symptoms of trauma. There's been exposure and mindfulness therapies which have been uh, developed and used, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, uh, as well as traumatic incidents reduction. Overall, improved coping is generally what we're looking for when people are experiencing trauma. So coping includes things like focusing first on safety, um, using psychoeducational means to help the person understand about how events, how stresses happen and how we react to them. The cognitive behavioral methods can include things like deep breathing and relaxation to help with the heightened emotional reactions, as well as cha challenging negative cognitions to uh, combat the uh, messages that seem to come in that say there's something wrong. Um, it encourages modeling from those who are having better coping skills. All of these things can help improve a person's coping because it's important to keep in mind that trauma can occur in a, as a result of some traumatic incident in the present, like an automobile accident, or it can be something that has um, happened in the, uh, the you know, in, you know, to adults who are coping with that, but having difficulty with it. Long-term trauma that's a reaction to something that happened during childhood or happened um, many months ago can sometimes become more complex and, and need a little bit more help in terms of uh, intervention. Whenever you're working with somebody who's experienced trauma, there's always the risk of re-traumatization. As a person remembers and tells their story, they often will experience the emotions that, were, that they were experiencing at the time that that event happened. It's important to assess whether that person has, um, can use calming and grounding techniques so that they don't become too overwhelmed. And if the client's arousal symptoms increase, it's important to stop talking about what's going on and to start talking about what is happening. You're, you're, you know, you're getting, um, your, your feelings are increasing and that's because it's natural for that to happen when you are thinking about this trauma that you've experienced. So you talk about the process in order to help the person stay grounded. A worker's good intentions can make the client's situations worse. You know, trying to help the client push through the story so it's no longer hidden is not always the best thing to do because that can involve an increased emotional reactions and sometimes suicidal thinking because they're feeling so overwhelmed. Helping people recover from trauma, particularly complex trauma, that is trauma that's resulted in post-traumatic stress disorder or trauma that's linked with a number, number of different traumas that the person has experienced or childhood trauma that an adult is still trying to cope with. This all requires specialized training in order to be able to assess what is going on and what's the best way to help a person with this. Being trauma-informed recognizes that people have different types of trauma in their lives, and there isn't just one trauma that everybody uh, responds to exactly the same. That, um, you know, that re-traumatization can happen, and we need to be aware of that. Trauma can be manifested in many different forms. Sometimes uh, 
you know, besides the emotional reactivity, there can be substance uh, abuse, uh, there can be different mental illness, as well as patterns of avoidance. The first goal when you're working with trauma is to minimize the harm that is currently happening as a result of the trauma. Uh, the Knight article, which you were asked to read, uh, talks about trauma-informed practice and gives you some ideas about the elements that you take into consideration when you're working with people with trauma. These are elements that help avoid re-traumatization using an anti-oppressive framework, for example, in which <coughs> you, you acknowledge that sometimes people um, need to overcome a sense that they're different or sometimes or that they're or that their feelings have not been taken into consideration or that something happened to them and it's uh, their fault for being part of a minority group. Avoid labeling people as sick or resistant. They're really struggling. Normalize and validate the client's feelings. So these are normal feelings that you're having because this is a really highly intense emotional situation that you are talking about. View the trauma as an injury. Shift from what's wrong with you questions to what has happened to you questions. Overall, there's five guiding principles. Pay attention to safety. The client has the choice. It's collaboration, not just you somehow working on the client. Trust, trustworthiness that the client needs to have an element of trust in you in order to feel okay about doing what they're doing as well as empowerment, that it's the client that needs to control what's going on. As I mentioned to you in the past, jotting down the ideas that you have learned from the reading, from the videos, from the tutorial can be really helpful in terms of putting this knowledge together and applying it to clients in your own practice. I'd like you to consider an element, uh, an example, excuse me, of trauma. This is a video of a woman's discussion of her abduction and rape. It's a very intense video. And so when you're watching it, it's really important that you have your own self-care kind of measures on hand. When you're watching this, consider the factors that made the event traumatic from what we've talked about. How did that event uh, be traumatic? How could it be defined that way? Consider the factors that influenced her reactions and her ultimate recovery. Once again, jot down your ideas if you, as you watch this video. I put the link once again in the comments. We're going to talk about Linda again in an in-class exercise. And similar to what I had you paying attention to when you were watching the video is small groups will be asked to discuss how Linda's story illustrates the aspects of trauma and what factors have influenced her traumatic recovery, her traumatic reaction and her eventual recovery. The fact that she can talk about this in public in a video is really a, um, a kind of a testament to the work that she's been able to do with the people she's uh, worked with. Consider what you learned, what you're gonna to bring to the classroom discussion and any questions you might have. And I'll see you in class.